Hey Tim, it's Black Soon. Awesome. So, okay, so start. we're live. Great. <laughs> exactly. Uh, we're live. So we are the fake starts, uh, but we're doing it again for you guys. Um, welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Mehdi. I work at Klaxoon and uh, I will be your host uh, for the next 30 minutes. Um, today, we are super glad to welcome Tamara Sanderson to talk about a very anticipated topic. Uh, hi, Tamara. How are you doing hi. today? I'm great. Thanks for having me. It's perfect. Uh, we will uh, go through your journey and introduce you uh, a little bit later. Um, today, uh, we're going to talk about, yeah, as I was saying, one of the most anticipated topic in the world of work uh, right now, uh, which is digital first setting and uh, reaching the highest level of inclusion of any team member, any uh, stakeholder on any uh, project or collective like project we could, uh, uh, could, we could think of. Um, so yeah, I'm not by myself. Uh, thank you so much for joining Tamara. Um, yeah, we can start off uh, by maybe uh, telling uh, what you do today and the journey you've been through uh, to arrive to uh, uh, your activity uh, okay. now. Great, awesome. Um, so we actually met live in the Klaxoon office maybe a month or two ago for a remote work um, kind of meet and greet. And so that is the topic we're going to be talking about today. Uh, I guess my foray into remote work, um, I was actually a remote worker before I even knew, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but now I um, have written a book, uh, co-written a book actually, and my co-writer lives in France. So hello um, to all the French folks out there. Uh, and it is called Remote Works, Managing for Freedom, Flexibility and Fun. And it officially comes out February 7th. Um, but I guess a little bit of this is um, I have done lots of different versions of distributed work. And before the pandemic, I worked for one of the largest all remote companies called Automatic, and it owns things like WordPress.com and WooCommerce and uh, WordPress VIP. And I remember when I left Google to join uh, Automatic, people were like, whoa, that's wild. Uh, remote work is not really a thing yet. Uh, WordPress had about, mm, I think now about 2000 people, but when I join maybe about um, 1200 people and it was the largest all remote company and it was considered niche and I was traveling around a lot that was part of why I did it but it wasn't considered mainstream and I remember even after automatic I joined IDEO which is a design thinking firm and I was in the Cambridge office it's like a very in-person kind of design feel and I was asked maybe two weeks before the pandemic to give a talk on this very niche thing called remote work uh, <laughs> to our organizational design consultants uh, by the time I actually gave the presentation the pandemic had happened and everybody's mindset had shifted on remote work. Um, but what I noticed is remote work when it's done well and it's very intentional and thought out like when I was at automatic looks very different than trying to remote work in the middle of a pandemic and switching overnight. And so that's a lot of what I wanted to share in that book. Um, but I can go a little bit about my background. Uh, it has been a journey and a path. Um, so I guess one of my favorite quotes about your journey is by Joseph Campbell. He wrote all these things on the hero's journey and myths. Uh, but one of the things he said is, if you can see your path laid out in front of you step by step, you know it's not your path. Your own path you make with every step you take. That's why it's your path. And so sometimes I get a little lost in describing where I come and what, what I've done. So I'm originally from Texas, uh, but I've actually been to 70 countries. I've been to all the continents and I lived abroad for nine years um, and once had like a very funky accent that was like part American, part Canadian and part kind of British. Uh, that has like uh, kind of gone away, but I was really much, uh, very much a traveler at heart. And that's what drove drove me to want to be a remote worker. Uh, I've had lots of various work, uh, you know, identities, been working for 16 years professionally. I graduated university in 2006, uh, but I started out as a management consultant. I was a private equity analyst. I was a Googler, uh, both in Mountain View and in Singapore. I was uh, an automatician, working remotely as a digital nomad, as a designer at IDEO, and now I am a writer. Uh, so remote works again, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to do the plug, but you know, the book is coming out in February if you're interested. Uh, I'm a small business owner, so I do a lot of consulting on remote work and I'm a remote work advocate, which is why I'm here today. Um, but you know, with all of that, I think one of the beautiful things about remote work is that you can really, um, I guess, uh, make work and life work for you. So I do a lot of kind of uh, personal, uh, uh, in personal, uh, 
oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Anyways, I, I try to do a lot of things in my personal life that are kind of edifying in certain ways. So I read a ton. I have a huge bookshelf over here. I love taking up new activities. Uh, I'm starting a psychoanalysis program in the fall. I do a lot of art. I'm starting to row in Boston and I'm a part of a dream school right now looking at a lot of Carl Jung's uh, philosophy. So I'm always up for a new activity because I think it broadens not only my perspective of the world, but it helps me when I'm working as well because I can bring those ideas into the fold. Amazing, perfect. What a, what a journey. Uh, that's, that's, thank you for, for sharing that uh, with, with us and our audience. Uh, I hope it will like inspire uh, our viewers. And um, something that I always like to ask uh, to, you know, like people really into like the remote work, like space um, is like, uh, do you think like there is like a personal like um, thing that happened that brought you uh, into being like such like a uh, fund of um, you know the liberty, the flexibility of uh, remote work? Is it something that, you know, comes back to the childhood, um, teenage years? I don't know. Yeah, so there's a couple experiences uh, that I think have made me very into remote work. First, I value a lot of autonomy. If you, so my parents, unlike yours, are not on the call right now. Uh, but if you were to ask my parents what was like the main thing, main word they would have used to describe me when I was younger, it was independent. So I was always had my own thing going on. I was like a six year old, like riding a bike, trying to start a club in the neighborhood, doing my own thing, just had this very independent spirit. And so I think because I value autonomy a lot, it drew me to remote work. Um, I would say another thing was I studied abroad when I was in university, when I was 20 to the UK. I think before that, I never really thought I'd leave Texas. And then I went to London and I decided actually, I will leave Texas probably permanently. And so that really changed the course of my life. And so the, the ability to live in new places and work with people from all over the world was really important to me. And I think remote work or you know being an expat in some form of, some form or fashion, like we both, um, you are now and I was previously, can be really like helpful and interesting. And then I guess the last thing that really helped was um, I had already done some different versions of, you know, kind of distributed work. But when I kind of went all in and joined an all remote company, I actually became a digital nomad. And so I got rid of everything I owned. I lived in one carry on bag and I just lived in Airbnbs around the world. And so that was um, a really stretching experience because uh, I was a solo traveler meeting up with a lot of friends, but often, you know, making my own decisions and kind of working uh, in different locations and kind of being alone a lot more than I was used to. And so I think that experience made me very comfortable with who I am. And um, that has actually helped me be a better person when working with other people as well. So those are a couple life experiences there. I also, I think this kind of ties in, I read Tim Ferriss's book, like a lot of people have, The Four Hour Work Week, maybe in 2008 when it was first coming out. And I remember thinking like, oh, I think he's really on to something here. And so I've always wondered how I can, I don't know, optimize the way I work. Uh, to make it, I don't know, to meet a lot of different needs that I had, whether it was I want, had professional goals, but I also had monetary goals, but I also had these like, I want a cool experience, I want to explore the world, and how could I make those all work together? Perfect, perfect. Yeah, I see like, finally, remote work is here like a way to like uh, mix like different like needs you have in life and um, envies and everything. So that's that's amazing, I think, uh, and really inspiring again. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, and yeah, um, let's jump right into uh, the topic uh, of our webinar right now. Uh, now that uh, you know where you come from. Um, and yeah, uh, so as, as we said, um, the, the, the main topic of today is really digital first culture um, and I think what would be interesting would be first like to define it uh, for our viewers. Um, so yeah, Tamara, what is for you a digital first culture and why is it that critical for organizations and companies to achieve it actually? Yeah, so sometimes I, um, the title of my book is remote work. So obviously remote work kind of plays into this, but sometimes I like to use the word digital first uh, because there can be a lot of like, I don't know, uh, philosophical arguments of like, oh, we're going to be all in person, we're going to be hybrid, we're going to be remote. And ultimately, I think those barriers are going to fall away in the future and everything will be digital first. So you are going to have best practices, which we, I like to think of as best remote working practices. And those will be 
in place, regardless if you are in the office all the time, sometimes or never. Uh, I think when you're creating a digital first culture, the most important thing is intentionality. It's just thinking of other people that might not be in the room with you at that moment. And how can you communicate those messages? Um, so I think, uh, you know, before the pandemic, if you weren't working remotely, there's, there was this thing that it's a whole different way of working. It's completely changed. And I do think when remote work is done well, actually it does change a lot, but ultimately I think we were all doing a little bit of remote work beforehand. Uh, whether you had freelance before, maybe you traveled for work. I was a management consultant. I sometimes joke that I was actually a remote worker before I even knew it had a name. Uh, because after my first project in St. George, Utah, I was traveling 10 hours each way to the consultant site. And I was like, I never want to do this again. Yeah. I then got rid of my apartment, took only international projects. I was in El Salvador and in London and things of that sort. But I just had my Blackberry and like my IBM ThinkPad laptop and I was essentially a remote worker at that time, even though I didn't really know I was, I just thought I was a traveling consultant. Um, or a lot of people, and um, my co-writer Allie often mentions this, people in an office were actually already doing a lot of remote work practices to begin with. So if you were using email, if you were using WebEx, if you ever had kind of a, a Google Hangout call or Zoom or something of that sort, all of those things were actually digital first ways of working, even if the person may have been located in the office. So we all had a little bit of, um, most office workers had a little bit of experience with remote work. And I think going forward, it's all about putting those best practices in place so that everybody is working digitally. So everybody has the same access to the same amount of information. Uh, in our book, we talk a lot about this concept called a digital house. It might be called a digital, like a knowledge hub. But you know, when you went into an office, there was kind of cues of what would happen. So you, um, you go to your desk to send emails. Maybe you go into a meeting room to have a conversation or a meeting, obviously. Maybe you go to the water cooler and you get some like office gossip, right? And so we knew like what happened at different places. But when you're moved online to like a, you know, I have a 13 inch screen here in front of me, can be a little bit difficult to navigate like what happens where. And so that's why I think it's really important when you're remote working to decide like what type of activity Activities happen in certain places. So maybe Slack is now where that, you know, water cooler conversation happens. Maybe Klaxoon is where you're having a lot of those collaborative meetings. Um, or, you know, you could, um, you know, with your emails, you might still be using email, but you might be using something different. So for example, when I was at Automatic, instead of email, we actually used um, internal blogs, and that's how we communicated with each other. But once you decide like what happens where, it's much easier to know and navigate this digital space. Then you can have some simple rules of like how everybody operates together. And then I know this never sounds like glamorous, but documentation is actually super important for remote work so that everybody knows what's happening. I think it's really great for um, inclusion to make sure that even if you weren't in the office that day or you weren't in that meeting, that people can you know, have access to information of what was happening and that it's also preserved so that when somebody leaves the team or leaves the company, that you have a record of decisions that were made. And it's just great for preservation going forward. Think of it like having artifacts of culture in a museum. You wanna have artifacts of your corporate culture in your digital house. That's that's perfect. That's so, so inspiring actually. Um... I'm, I'm pretty sure like a lot of like our viewers never heard about that like concept uh, before. So yeah, if you want to go in depth uh, on that topic, uh, you know where to find some information uh, with, your, <laughs> with your book. Uh, we'll, we'll post actually the, uh, you know, the like purchase link uh, and everything, every info about it. Uh, so thank you so much, Tamara, um, like breaking that down uh, for us. That's perfect. Um, actually, that is super important and uh, um, for us at Klaxoon, we are really on that like concept of inclusion. So uh, we absolutely dig with uh, what you uh, uh, what you just said and um, yeah, to add a little bit, to advocate a little bit uh, on, on our like part, uh, we truly believe actually that um, yeah, inclusion and making sure like everyone is experiencing like the same thing. And that's really a cultural like uh, shift finally 
um, to you know think about them. Uh, as soon as you think about them, then you do like the the right like settings um, to to make sure everyone is involved. So that's that's perfect because that links up perfectly with uh, uh, what we do at Klexum. So yeah. Yeah, uh, I was just gonna say I think actually you know a lot of people don't like to take notes in meetings. What's beautiful about Klexum? So we've been actually kind of brainstorming something we'll mention a little bit later about kind of a co-working pop-up. But you know we've been working together in Klexum, and what's really nice is you can have a meeting. So we had our faces there, so you can have your little avatars. But we're kind of brainstorming live, but then we have the artifact after and it was just a part of the meeting so we didn't actually have to take a ton of written notes because we were kind of note keeping as we were ideating and something like that is so great because you have those artifacts without having to be like okay great now um, my day's finished i can't wait to do an hour of posting notes of all these things so the more you can put note taking in um uh documentation into your natural workflow. It's a lot easier. I use Asana for project management with my co-writer and all of our notes are in Asana. We can always find it. And it's so much easier than um, trying to like share my very scribbly, horrible notes here. I have very bad handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like like most of most of us actually. So yeah, definitely uh, definitely better. Um, that that's perfect. Thank you so much for those insights. Uh, the next topic we wanted to address with you is um, uh, opening opening up a little bit on the the, the future, right? Um, and we wanted to ask you what would be for you the next big challenges uh, that remote whole like hybrid workers and their companies uh, will be facing in the next weeks, months, uh, years, uh, we, we don't know. And uh, uh, yeah, how to tackle those like big challenges uh, ahead of us, basically. Yeah, so there was two things that immediately came to my mind when you kind of mentioned we might talk about this today. And some of this might be a little bit from an American perspective, but um, maybe you can add in from like a French law perspective. So we have both of those. Um, but I think one thing that we're gonna start kind of um, disassembling or unpacking would be just the nine to five day. Uh, a lot of that, I think historically, there could be different ways of that, how that came about. But I guess the myth of the US is that the nine to five came about from Ford. And those were the hours for people to manufacture cars. And I don't necessarily think we need that anymore. And I think as we do more remote work, we can actually move uh, away from input culture to an output culture. So when I think of the input culture, I think of the concept of, uh, there's a movie in the US called Field of Dreams and it was about a baseball field. But like the popular quote there is like, if you build it, people will come. And I think in the office culture, there was this idea, if people come for 40, 50 hours a week to this office, work will get done as long as they show up. And I think with remote work, it actually moves more to an output culture because you're not requiring people to be, you know, but in seat for a certain amount of hours per day. Instead, you're like, here's the thing you need to deliver this week. Did you deliver your job? Or here's your role and responsibilities. How are you going to show up for the next quarter? And I think when that happens, the nine to five kind of stops making as much sense, especially when you're hiring people from all over the world. Um, when I was at Automatic, there was like over... I mean, way over a hundred countries represented. I was working mostly, I was working in Cape Town, the country of Georgia, Mexico City. I was often um, talking with people in Silicon Valley. And so I think from that geographical perspective that you wanna be able to hire people that are not just in the same time zone or in the same city. And with that, you kind of need to break down that nine to five. So I think that is part of what will happen. I often kind of, um, Think of this as moving from a high school model of work to a college model of work. So um, in American high schools, usually you get in at eight and you go to four, everybody you know, goes class, 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 and then you're out. Uh, the teacher has a lot of control. They're watching you the whole time. Uh, you have to have all these like specific requirements of homework every day. And then um, moving into university, there's a lot more freedom. You come into school, your first day, your professor may give you a syllabus, what's expected of you, you know, when you're uh, exam or your paper is going to be due, but your college professor is not calling you every day and saying, hey, how are you doing? Where are you? <laughs> Where are you on that paper? Or like, did you study today? Because you have a test in three days. Instead, that onus and that autonomy is on the student. And so with that, I think um, remote work is moving away from that high school model of corporations. You come in and somebody tells you what to do and you're just kind of at their beck and call all day to actually moving more to a university model of here's what I expect of you, but you're an adult. You figure it out on your own time. And I will, you know, you, you do have deliverables, you will be kind of judged on your output, 
but you can get it done how you want to. And I think there's a lot of power in that. Uh, the second thing I think is going to change is usually, you know, jobs are often thought of as full-time or part-time work. And I know the, the laws might be a little bit different in France versus the U.S., um, but in the U.S., there's like a definite uh, difference between those two. And once you're doing kind of, you move from full-time to part-time work, often you don't have the same benefits. Um, things get kind of wonky with your pay. And I think what's going to happen with remote work is you're going to see uh, more of a blur there that uh, no longer are you going to be just like based on the hours that you work, but it'll be on the demands of your work. And I think that's going to shift what's considered a full-time job. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's people are going to want more flexibility with that of how, how working looks. So for example, uh, my first job out of college, I was a management consultant at Oliver Wyman, and we could actually take a 10 month year, which was kind of interesting. So we would work 10 months and we could take two additional months off in the summer we would get less pay but we were able to kind of change our schedule and i think we'll see more things like that just giving people flexibility to work around what they need in their life uh, so those are two things but also i think with hybrid as i mentioned before i think that's going to have to be figured out corporation by corporation i actually am doing a workshop tomorrow with a law firm in san francisco and they're creating new policies um, and kind of procedures within their organization for remote working uh, I, I think with hybrid, people are going to have to start rethinking some of their um, office space plans, how that office is going to be used. It could be used for kind of client meetings. It can be used for co-working, like how it could be used um, to bring people from the community into those offices. I think you're going to have to think differently. And I'm not a... I don't know. I think the idea that you just require everybody to come in three days a week on the same day, I don't think that's totally taking advantage of remote work. So I think we're going to think that's a good step in a direction of how do you combine remote and in office work. But I think you're going to see a lot more uh, nuance in the future of allowing people to decide more on when they need to show up to an office and what they're getting out of that versus just a specific day of the week. Cool. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much for all those uh, insights. That is uh, that is perfect. And that's actually, um, I mean, I've been like, of course, like a lot on those topics and everything. And those are like really like fresh ideas and uh, new ways to, to see things. So uh, we actually love that. Thank you so much, uh, Tamara. Uh, we have a last topic uh, we wanted to address with you. Uh, and that's actually something we are kind of working uh, together uh, on um, is talking about the potential like social gaps uh, that uh, remote or like hybrid workers um, can experience. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Like what kind of like solutions um, um, can we like find in order to fill in those like potential social gaps that happens with remote work? Yeah, so I do think kind of the isolation and social gaps are definitely real. Uh, for uh, my book that's coming out, uh, the foreword is written by Matt Mullenweg, who's the founder of WordPress and Automatic. He alluded to the same thing, and he's kind of the OG, the original of kind of remote work. He started Automatic in 2004, so he sees that as an issue too. Uh, I think you know, with I think you do have to reimagine how you're getting some of your social outlet. Um, so before, I don't know if anybody's like most people are familiar with Gallup and they do a lot of surveys, but one of the surveys said that, you know, one of the key indicators of like your effort and your performance as a job was having a best friend at work. And we think, um, Ali, my co-writer and I, we think that, you know, we're going to move into this world where it's not a best friend necessarily at work, even though that's great, uh, but it'll be a best friend to work with. You do mm. need to have somebody so that you're not always alone every day doing your work. And so a couple examples of this would be, you can work in a cafe. So even if you might not even be talking to people at the cafe, you are around other people, or you can have somebody else that's a remote worker and you go to a cafe. So my co-writer and I, when we were both digital nomads, uh, we hosted two uh, remote offsites uh, in one in um, Belgrade and one in Mexico City. And a lot of us would, you know, come casually and we'd you know, spend two hours at a cafe. We'd be working for different corporations, but we do some of our work and do some, you know, might be emailing or writing a document or making a presentation. And then we'd have some casual conversation. We go back to work and it still felt very social, but it wasn't necessarily um, 
always your coworkers. I also think with remote work, it's important to see colleagues in person. Um, so, you know, having a meetup once a year is really important. Maybe going to a conference where you're going to see other people from CLAC soon could be really important. Uh, I was in tech, so I used to always go to Google I.O. and F8 and things of that sort. So I think those, you know, meeting people that are in your profession are important. Um, but also, this is kind of what uh, we've been brainstorming a little bit about is, you know, once once your social is not all through work. And I think this has been very popular for millennials. I know, for example, I had a time in my life where I think 90% of my friends were Googlers and even my very best friend that was not a Googler married a Googler. And I was like, wow, <laughs> this is really small Google world all the time. And it was lovely. And it would really help me make friends in San Francisco and Singapore. Um, but you know you're gonna like as we move to remote work your whole world is not going to be like associated with the company most likely and i think that can be actually healthy for work-life balance and so there's can be ways that you can start you know um having some of that social so one example is i'm involved with a lot of community activities and so i'm in a rowing group i'm in a dream analysis group i'm in a meditation group i'm in um do a lot of art classes i think it's important to kind of get out there i do a lot of volunteering and so that kind of add some of my social. I also go much longer to visit people. I was just gone for three weeks. I uh, hosted a kids camp for four of my nieces and nephews uh, for a week, which was really fun. And then I visited a lot of good friends in San Francisco. But what we've been working on is um, hopefully this will be coming September, October. So get excited. But we want to do co-working pop-ups where Klaxoon, as you can see behind Midi, there's like a beautiful beautiful space. And what we would like to do is have a, you know, a couple hour session where we have a cool speaker, we do some yoga, we do a little happier, maybe you send some emails in between, but an experience of how you can work together with some people that might actually be your coworkers, but some people that are from other organizations and just get this idea of how you can meet people that are in your local community that might be also looking for a remote work friend. Exactly, exactly. So that was a great teaser. That was a great teaser. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for everything you've been sharing. I love the concept of um, best friend to, to work with and not best friend at work. Um, I can totally like um, dig that because um, actually, so during like all those times of remote working, so we sometimes we cheated a little bit, right? Uh, during curfews and everything and uh, lockdowns. And um, I've been working like in the same room uh, than people, friends uh, that were working in different organizations. And I totally like um, could, uh, get inspired but what i was like seeing as well so it's like definitely like beneficial for everyone i think too so that's amazing to have like it as a concept actually so i i love that um that is perfect it's actually the last topic we wanted to address with you today uh but we have uh, questions but we oh, so we started late uh, do you have still like a few minutes ahead yeah. of you yeah, yeah, sure. That's perfect because, like, we um, actually have, have questions. Um, first, uh, one is actually a kind of a personal question. Um, it's coming from Lucia and it's asking, What is your own ideal remote work setting, uh, Tamara? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. And we talk, again, sorry, we talk about this a little in our book. Surprise, surprise. Um, but there is this concept called chronotypes. And so you can be AM shifted, PM shifted, or bi biphasic, which means like you have two peaks. And I am very much a night owl. And I have been kind of forced in the traditional work world to sometimes be a morning person. I remember when I was at Google, I would be on like the early morning shuttle to Mountain View. I'd have to wake up at like 6 a.m. And I was like so groggy all the time. And uh, we interviewed a professor that's at UC Berkeley, and this is real science, and about 20% of people are night owls, 25% are morning birds, and the rest uh, are in between. And so with remote work, the thing that I like love the best is I've been really able to shift according to my energy. And so I wake up a lot later than I used to. I wake up around 10. Uh, I do some work at, in the morning. I might do some like outdoor activities or take a nap or like more usually during the middle of the day, I do kind of more uh, personal things. And then I get to do more of my work at night. 
And what has been really helpful about this is basically um, the way that my biology is, is my first time of focus throughout the day is actually 5 to 7 p.m., which is actually after traditional work hours. I get like usually a creative boost from like at like 11 to, to 1 in the morning. And so I've been able to shift that way. And so that might, I have a lot of flexibility right now because I'm a writer and I own my own business. Um, but when I was a remote worker at Automatic, I started playing with this. And the way I did was uh, I was working mostly in Europe. I was in Portugal a lot. And I would kind of, um, you know, I, but I had to work a lot with people in San Francisco or on the East Coast in New York. And so I'd take my calls at night, I'd do some work in the morning, I'd go to a museum or take a, you know, a long walk along these beautiful streets or um, beautiful water, I would have like a snack and I would do a little bit more work and then do a later dinner. And I just was able to actually um, design my day based on like what fit me best. And I was actually able to do my work a lot faster when it was on my own schedule. Cause something that might take me three hours at 8 a.m. when I'm really tired and just like car sick from being on a bus might actually take me one hour if I do it at 5 p.m. And so that ended up just feeling a lot more natural. And I, uh, I ended up being a lot more, I think, productive uh, and successful at automatic just from um, it being more tuned to me. And, you know, a lot of people are not night owls. So I don't recommend that for the majority of people, but for people like me, it did help. Yeah. Amazing. I'm actually, I'm actually just like you. So <laughs> I'm, 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 I might ask my employer if I can do that. Like, I don't, I don't want to get, I don't want to get in trouble, but I, I will tell it's because of you, Tamara, so. Okay. <laughs> it's science, it's, honestly. It's yeah. science, I could direct you to the Berkeley lab, so. Exactly, exactly. I will tell it's science, guys. Yeah. I need to work at yeah. night. Uh, but actually, no, but, but like, actually, that's really inspiring. And um, yeah, I'm pretty sure everyone can find like his own like schedule and um, ways of like doing things, designing their work day. So um, perfect. Uh, another question um, is coming from Rachel, and she's asking, how can we face mental health issues that come with working remotely? So we've been kind of talking about it, but uh, I let you answer that. Yeah, so I think um, with mental health, it's important to break down where you're feeling that stress and that burden. So a couple of things that I think I've heard about a lot is burnout, and that can often be from not having boundaries between work and life. I think if that is kind of the core issue you're finding with mental health issues, then it's really important to start creating boundaries. And some things when we, we interviewed 30 to five different remote workers for our book, including our own opinions. Um, but what we learned is a lot of people have a ritual to end work. And so they might put on that Slack message, say they're not answering right away. You know, maybe they've really gotten into asynchronous communication. So they're not always on, they can you know, do their work at night and it's expected the next, you know, the next day, but they get to decide when they're doing their work. Um, but yeah, the, a lot of people say that they'll um, create a ritual. So somebody might, instead of doing a commute, they might do a 20 minute walk and that's their, you know, their exit from like work life to personal life. Uh, another woman we interviewed, she actually plays the piano for an hour in between. And that like lets her kind of get out of work mode and get into personal mode. So I think that can be really important. I think another thing for mental health is also just like leaning in as much as you can to asynchronous communication. Because nobody wants, I mean, we were talking earlier about, um, I actually put the view off so I can't see myself on Zoom, but it can even just be a burden of being on Zoom and seeing yourself all day. That can be a lot of, um, I don't know, it can be very draining. And so I think the more that you can um, do work on your own time, I think that can be helpful for mental health. I think we mentioned a little bit about isolation and loneliness. So how can you get your social needs met that are not necessarily in an office? And then like lastly, I think actually when remote work is done well, it can be designed to actually help your mental health. So um, there's a couple of key needs. I think it's like Daniel Pink has it, but like it also touches into Maslow and some other different motivation theories, but it's um, autonomy, mastery, and purpose are often like the three things that drive people. And with remote work, if you can create an environment where you have that autonomy to make decisions, you feel like you can own your work and own your day, that can help with your mental health. Um, if you feel like you can master something, that you can actually spend time and be an expert on something that can help you feel you know, good about yourself at work. And if you have some type of um, 
you know, purpose within your organization, whether you really align with the mission statement or you really, you know, you purposely like that work that you're doing or remote work allows you to live your purpose outside of work. So for example, I do a lot of volunteering. Remote work allows me to volunteer more than I could at an organization. But I think if you can design your life to meet who you are, like the things that you know that stress you out, um, the more that you can help your mental health by making those proactive decisions. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally like get what you uh, what you were saying, and um, something we've been like talking about but not mentioning exactly. And you just mentioned it is asynchronous work um, is such such a critical like topic in uh, the way remote work can work, but also can help and benefit for like uh, mental health uh, issues uh, of workers and remote workers, especially. So um, that's that's amazing. You've been mentioning that. Um, we're actually going to, to wrap it up there. Uh, that was so insightful. Thank you so much, uh, Tamara, for everything you've been sharing. Uh, before leaving us, um, maybe can you uh, just like remind us what's coming next uh, for you, where we can also uh, follow your news announcements and everything? Yeah. Okay. So there's a couple places. So you can follow me on LinkedIn, Tamara Sanderson. Um, that's one thing. Oh, sorry. I just had some coffee. Uh, the second thing is remoteworksatbook.com. That is our website. Sign up for our newsletter. We have a free energy tracker you can get if you're wanting to know more about your chronotypes. Uh, our book comes out in February. It's going to be uh, distributed through Barrett Kohler in the U.S. and Penguin Random House internationally. So look out for that. I think we are going to have a version in French available. I know that there's kind of a um, our one of the people that does the international rights is French. So I expect it to be there as well. Uh, but leading up to that, we're going to do a lot of events. I teach for O'Reilly. Um, I do a lot of blogging and we're going to do our co-working pop-ups, right? Um, so come join Mehdi and I sometime in the Klaxoon office, hopefully, and uh, learn how to co-work. And if you are in Boston area, I'm always looking to meet people. So uh, I would love to grab a coffee at a, um, you know, a cafe around here or take a walk or go to a park and just, you know, learn more about kind of your work and I can share a little bit more about mine. Amazing. Uh, what a perfect uh, way to, to wrap it up. Um, I'm going to do the same for Klaxon a little bit. So yeah, uh, feel free to follow us on our uh, socials, obviously. Uh, we will have uh, uh, next and over like uh, webinars uh, in, the, in the next weeks. So yeah, feel free uh, to, uh, to join us, to follow us. And that was an absolute pleasure again to have you, uh, Tamara. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, to uh, any of our like viewers uh, for watching this. And um, yeah, uh, we can wrap it up. Thank you so much. And uh, I will see you around. Bye, guys. Okay. Bye, Tamara. Bye.